Globally News. Hi everyone, welcome to The Pivot. My name is Arif Rafiq and I'm your host. In 2019, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abi Ahmed won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to resolve the border conflict with neighboring Eritrea. Eritrea, which had been part of Ethiopia since the 1950s, separated in 1993 after a protracted civil war. One of the many conflicts in a country and region divided by ethnicity and nationality. Later that decade, independent Eritrea and Ethiopia would once again be at war, a conflict that would not only take the lives of tens if not hundreds of thousands of people, but also denied landlocked Ethiopia access to Eritrean ports. Coming to power in 2018, Abiy, as he's known, in the view of some, pursued a path of reconciliation, both within and without, releasing political prisoners inside the country and appearing to bury the hatchet with Eritrea. But appearances, as they say, can be deceiving. And while Abi may have played the part of peacemaker, his motives were clearly more complex. By the next year, Ethiopia would be mired in yet another civil war. Abi teamed up with Eritrean strongman Isaias Afuerke to take on the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF, a party representing an ethnic minority that had dominated Ethiopia from 1991 into 2018. Abi's abrupt shift from peacemaker to warmonger reflects the contradictions in this leader of Africa's second most populated country, a country that's being courted by both great and regional powers, including the United States, China, and the United Arab Emirates. So who really is Abi Ahmed? What are his beliefs? And what is his vision for Ethiopia? Those questions are the subjects of a new book by our guest, Tom Gardner, the Economist Correspondent for East Africa. Gardner's book, The Abi Ahmed Phenomenon, which I highly recommend, is now out in the UK and will be available in the US later this fall. We've got a link to it in the show notes. And now on to our show. Tom Gardner, thank you for joining us. So this is a fascinating book about a fascinating, confounding man who, who leads a pivotal state in a pivotal part of the world. And Abi Ahmed, as you explain in your book, reflects some of the defining features of international politics in our time, uh, the rise of the strong man and the emergence of a multipolar era. But as they say, all politics is local. And Abi is an enigma who manifests to some extent, but also tries to escape the perennial challenge that Ethiopia faces, which is that of ethnicity and, and some in the country would say nationality. So I'd like to start by asking you to talk to us about how Abi fits into this matrix of ethnicity in Ethiopia and why his rise to power in 2018 was so significant. Sure. So to put it kind of very simply, Abi identifies as Oromo. That's the largest, the most populous ethnic group in Ethiopia. And historically, was one of the, the, the more marginalized groups in the country. There are about 80 or more different ethno-linguistic groups in Ethiopia. It's an enormously diverse country. Um, but Abi comes from the Oromo, and when he comes to power in 2018, he's sort of hailed as someone um, from a you know, once subjugated community. That's the way his rise is celebrated you know, by many of his followers. But also internationally, uh, there was this sort of sense that, or uh, an understanding that the Oromos were politically underrepresented, didn't have as much political power as the numbers suggest that they should have. And, and so he, that's the sort of way he comes onto the political scene. Uh, this is in a country where, just to kind of give you a very quick summary of the political ethnic land, landscape, the other two important ethnic groups to know, to know something about are the Amhara, the second largest ethnic group, which historically were the sort of most powerful or dominant in the process of Ethiopia's long history of state building. And the others were a much smaller group, around 6% of the population, the Tigrayans. Um, and in more recent years, after in the 1990s and, and 2000s and some of the 2010s, uh, they had been widely understood to be the most powerful group in the country, uh, at least you know, proportionate to their relatively small population size. So I've become to power in that context, 
but it's also it's it's a bit more complicated than that because he also I'm sure we'll go into this. He comes to power as an Oromo politician, but he is also an Ethiopian nationalist. That's another big part of his political identity and his political project. Uh, and the tensions in Ethiopia between what's called ethnic nationalism, which Oromo nationalism is is one, and Pan Ethiopian, as it were, nationalism. On the other hand, these are often seen as intention in violent contradiction. Uh, and Abby seems to kind of straddle the, the, these two camps in a, in, in a slippery and confounding way. Right. And he defies uh, categorization, uh, at least, you know, in terms of these, these traditional divides that, as you outlined in your book, have, have continued to bedevil uh, Ethiopia. And, and these are the questions of what is Ethiopia? Who is an Ethiopian? Who gets to rule Ethiopia? And how is it ruled? And, and as you write, Ethiopia remains in important ways the world's last empire, uh, a fragile, fissiparous federation of peoples held by force. So talk to us about that, that fragility. Uh, you, you, you talked about it to some degree in terms of the, the tensions between uh, centralization and then uh, these, these more localized entities and, and the ethnicities and the nationalities. So modern Ethiopia was long ruled by monarchs from the Amharan ethnicity, right? And Abi comes to power and he is the first Oromo who gets to rule uh, Ethiopia. He, he, he sort of doesn't fit into a neat categorization because he embraces Ethiopian nationalism, but he comes from a group that has been seen as, as marginalized, uh, despite being, you know, representing a plurality of, of Ethiopians. So what was the, before Abi came to power, what has long been kind of the traditional view of what an Ethiopian is? Well, you mentioned the Amhara, and yes, when it comes to Ethiopian history, it's always more complicated than it appears, you know, at first glance. And Ethiopia's emperors, which you know that the tradition of uh, of monarchical rule goes back many, many centuries, they did often come from, or more often than not, came from the the area that we, today is known as Amhara, and traditionally spoke Amharic, which today is the lingua franca of the nation. It is more complicated in the sense that there have been Tigrayan emperors and monarchs as well, and there have even been romo speaking ones too. Though, uh, you know, Abi, as you rightly said, was the first Ethiopian leader to kind of openly uh, identify as a Romo uh, rather than as an Ethiopian. Ethiopian identity, as it's been forged over the centuries, does certainly contain a, a, a kind of core, which is, well, it's Amhara in the sense of being most likely to be associated with Amharic speakers, but also Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. That's a massive part of Ethiopian identity. You know, Ethiopia is home to Africa's, or indeed one of the world's oldest Christian churches. Christianity arrived in Ethiopia you know, 3,000 years ago. Uh, and you can trace this line of Ethiopian identity over the centuries, which is always kind of indelibly entwined with with the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox faith. Abbey himself, just to kind of flesh out a bit more of, of who he is in, in relation to these components of Ethiopian national identity, his mother may well have been, it's not entirely clear, but his mother may well have been Amhara, um, Amhara herself. He is, his first language really is, is, is Amharic, not Aroma, but his father was a Muslim Aroma. And that's why he, he kind of grew up as an, uh, uh, raised by his father, at least as an Aroma, and he joins he enters politics, he, he joins the Oromo political party that's a component part of the national coalition which governed Ethiopia for three decades and, until actually Abiy takes power. So he's, yes, he's Oromo, but he's also got this Amhara side to him. His mother imbued in him a, a very clearly kind of Christian Orthodox sense of Ethiopian history and identity, even though as a boy he was you know, formally raised um, as a Muslim. And then later, as an adult, he adopts Ethiopian Pentecostal Christianity, sort of evangelicalism. He has a, a revelation in his very kind of early 20s whilst, whilst fighting in the Ethiopian army and surviving actually a, 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 a deadly airstrike in which all, all, all but one of his fellow comrades in his unit were killed. So he has become, in, since then, an Ethiopian Pentecostal Christian. And that's a, that's a kind of 
uh, a rising, uh, almost insurgent uh, movement within Ethiopian Christianity. And that sets him apart as well from kind of traditional Ethiopian identity. So there's a lot of, and I, and I try and explain this in the book, there are, you know, his identity and his background contains multiple different strands, which overlap to some degree with Kind of traditional Ethiopian national identity, but also do not. And that feeds into the kind of uh, ambiguities of him as a person, as a political figure that I've sought to convey in the book. Yeah, you do a great job in the book of conveying uh, the, these ambiguities, the contradictions, and the overall uncertainty as to who Abiy Ahmed is. And uh, and and it, you know that deals with uh, you know not the, just to the question of identity, but also with with power, who gets to rule. Uh, Ethiopia and how it's ruled. So before we unpack uh, Abi Ahmed, the person, I just want to kind of help our listeners understand this question of how Ethiopia has governed. Because uh, since the late 19th century, there's been this tension between um, centralization and then uh, in a more contemporary era, uh, federalism. And so Abi has his own particular view of, but what has, what's the sort of the, the, the short explanation for this this battle over how Ethiopia has should be ruled. Sure, yeah. So it's this, as you met, as you say, rightly say, it's this kind of long-standing tension between kind of centralizing trends and and federalizing or decentralizing tendencies under the empire, and particularly under Emperor Haile Selassie, who I'm sure many listeners uh, are, are familiar to some degree with. Uh, in the 20th century, the the, the presiding tendencies in Ethiopian governance were not just monarchical, but assimilating. The idea was to build a modern unitary nation state, basically along, along a, let's say, French lines, uh, where everyone speaks a, a common language. They are, at least to be part of the kind of ruling elite, they are from the same religious background. Um, that's Ethiopian orthodoxy. Uh, and they are supposed encouraged to or exhorted to to just dis- discard their their ethnic identities whether those are Roma, Amhara, Tigrayan or many many more the countries I said is there are there are 80 plus of these different ethnic groups that lasts until 1974 um, the Ethiopian revolution this incredibly uh, radical Marxist uh, social revolution which overthrew Emperor Haile Selassie there was talk at that time of recognizing and empowering the different ethnic groups, kind of answering what was then called the nations and nationalities question. But that didn't go very far. And the, 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 the Marxist uh, military regime, which succeeded the empire, essentially continued in the same vein, the same centralizing, top-down authoritarian vein, with Amhara or Amharic speakers overwhelmingly at the kind of in the upper echelons of the, the, the state in a kind of Amharic, Amhara-focused Ethiopian identity remaining dominant. That all changes, and this is the next big pivot by which Ethiopian history turns, in 1991, when the Derg, the military regime, itself is overthrown in another revolution, um, this time led by the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, the EPRDF, which is a multi-ethnic coalition of ethnic liberation movements, um, which obviously were more common ac- across much of Africa, across much of colonial Africa uh, in the 60s and 70s. And Ethiopia, they'd also sprouted uh, in reaction to, to, to the, to the Derg authoritarianism. And some of them were calling for uh, secession, for independence, for the breakup of the Ethiopian uh, state. But the EPRDF, which was led by a Tigrayan um, Liberation Front, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, which you know, was the, kind of the vanguard of this, this multi-ethnic coalition and therefore dominated to some degree over the next three decades, they decided to take a different, uh, a radically different approach to the problem of Ethiopian um, nation building. They basically said, look, We've tried this. We've tried this coercive model of of nation building. It's not working. We need to try something completely different. And what they did was they introduced what's called multinational federalism, through its detractors, ethnic federalism, and it redefined the Ethiopian state as a voluntary union 
of different nations, nationalities, and peoples. This is language actually derived from, from, from Lenin and Stalin and the Soviet Union, and also kind of Yugoslavia as well. Um, and basically that meant that the country was divided into various regions, each with significant autonomous powers, including the, the right to kind of administer in their own languages, to teach in their own languages, and to raise their own security forces as well, which is a problem that comes back to bite uh, Ethiopia a bit several decades later and to this day. It also basically provided for the right of self-determination for Ethiopia's constituent groups up to, and this is the really controversial part, including secession. So that's the new Ethiopia that emerges in the 1990s, a new federal dispensation made up of regions defined by ethnic linguistic um, criteria. So you have a region of Tigray, a region of Oromia, a region of Ampara, and many, many more. It is, however, from the get-go contested by many, particularly from people from Amhara, who traditionally identified with the with the Ethiopian kind of centralized Ethiopian state. And ever since then, there have been this is this has been a kind of central con contestation in Ethiopian politics. What kind of country should it be? And is this kind of federal system really suitable or is it dividing the country further? Right. So this uh, this federal system enacted by the EPRDF attempts to solve this problem of ethnicity and nationality. But in the end, it uh, exacerbates it. We have Eritrea finally seceding from Ethiopia, uh, I think in 1991. And then also there is this contestation of the boundaries uh, within Ethiopia itself between these uh, ethnic enclaves. And then there's also just this uh, question of, um, you know, whether federalism weakens or strengthens Ethiopia. And for Abi, you know, he's both an insider and an outsider. He's an Oromo, but uh, he also clings to this idea of a strong uh, Ethiopia. And so he actually is a, a proponent of, of these centralizing tendencies to some degree. So he has this, um, he comes to power in 2018 and is seen to some degree as a reformer. But uh, let's talk about his, his path to power because his initial rise to power is framed in a particular way in the international press. But uh, who was Abi before he came to power? He's, he was very much a military man, a security man, right? Yeah. So I, I, I describe him in the book as a sort of Pentecostal Putin. Pentecostal, uh, you know, uh, that part is self-evident, as I, as I explained. But um, Putin, because he very much like Putin, is a product of the intelligence services. Um, Abby um, is a very, very young, young man, actually, is a 14 year old teenager, basically runs away from home and joins um, the EPRDF, uh, the Oromo element of the EPRDF. And through that, joins the Ethiopian army. He then um, takes part in the Ethiopian Eritrea War. 1998 to 2000, as you rightly mentioned, Eritrea was also one of these constituent parts of, of, the, of Ethiopia up until 1990, um, 1991, before seceding uh, to form its own country. And then five years later, going to, to war with, the, with Ethiopia, a very, very devastating war, which Abiy was a very young um, soldier in. Um, after that, he moves to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And kind of cut a long story short, joins what was then a new agency, a cyber intelligence agency in the early 2000s, uh, kind of modeled on America's NSA. Um, the goal was to sort of um, uh, defend Ethiopia from, from, from cyber threats, but also monitor Ethiopia's neighbors, gather cyber intelligence, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and he's really good at one thing uh, in particular. He's not really a technical guy, although he goes to um, uh, South Africa to train in cryptography before the founding of this, the establishment of this cyber intelligence agency. But what he's really good at is networking and communication. Um, I spoke to many people who worked with him in the 2000s in this intelligence agency, and he was really, they said he was really good. Yeah, his people skills were excellent. He was slick. He was charming. That's something that comes up again and again. And he manages to make friends with really powerful people in very 
high places, ultimately including uh, the then Tigrayan prime minister for nearly two decades until his death, uh, untimely death in 2012, Mele Zanawi. Abin knows everyone. He is absolutely the consummate insider, but he kind of rises without a trace over this period, at least in the sense of the, the, the public don't know who he is because, you know, he's a spook for, for, for the 2010s. He's hacking people's phones. He's spying on people. Um, he learns the dark arts of, of the kind of the Ethiopia's security state. And it's a, you know, it was one of Africa and remained one of Africa's most fearsome security states. But he's also, uh, at this point, he's also slowly making his way up the political ladder too. He is using his connections to, well, in 2010, stand for parliament and make his way up the, the ladder of the ruling party in the course of the 2010s. Um, so as much as he then, when he comes to power, sort of positions himself as this sort of outsider, he, he really isn't. Uh, he was just somewhat of an unknown entity to the Ethiopian public um, until quite late in the day. Right. And, and uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of Bill Clinton to some extent, because when Bill Clinton was young and he had, I think, his first internship in Congress, he really did very little work in the office. He was generally seen in the hallways, networking with people. And, and that was ultimately uh, one of his gifts in terms of power, this ability to uh, connect with people. And that's what uh, gave him ability to, for example, weather the impeachment uh, in the 1990s. But Abi seems to have uh, the, that same level of skill, but in a much more manipulative fashion. And so what stands out in your narrative is how he's able to convince people uh, or many people that he's on their side. And he is sort of like the student who doesn't really study much, but can kind of BS his way through the class and and impress many or most people, except for those who are, are truly experts on the subject. And so there's a quote in your book, Abi doesn't have the patience for nuance, and I don't think he has the, any intellectual depth. depth. This is a colleague of his who's, who's stating this, but he's good with technology, and he can Google something, read about it on, on Wikipedia, and then turn it into a PowerPoint presentation. So Abi has, uh, as you outlined in your book, has fashioned himself as a kind of a reformer, a kind of a corporate CDO, CEO in the in in the form of a, a prime minister of a leader, but there isn't too much depth to how he pursues you know these policies of whether they're economic or in terms of social reform and peace building. But what is uh, I think uh, pretty established about Abi in is the importance of religion to him, and and that all is also you know tied to his perception of self which uh, I think, um, as you alluded to earlier, uh, comes to a large extent from his mother. So I'd like you to talk to us about the, the role of religion in Abi's life and, and his worldview. Sure. I mean, as you, 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 yes, as you said, um, I don't think Abi is a particularly ideological person in, in the sense we might understand that term, uh, or a policy um, focused kind of guy. He's not a policy wonk and he's not a, a, a kind of great intellectual, though he has published all these books kind of stating what he describes as his political philosophy. Um, typically, you know, most Ethiopians don't take any of these, uh, these kind of doctrinal uh, pronouncements too seriously. But I do argue in the book that he has a certain vision, the kind of Ethiopia he wants to see. And that region is that that vision is undoubtedly informed by a religious outlook. Um, some have gone as far, and I, and I kind of hinted this at various points in the book, some have gone, gone as far as to sort of see him as, as much a religious figure as a, as a political one. I mean, he, he expressly sees himself in, in kind of prophetic terms. Now, that's a, the kind of prophetic tradition in Ethiopian politics is not specifically a Pentecostal thing. It's a, it, you know, Ethiopia's imperial monarch were God's anointed. They were, you know, representatives of, of, of God on earth. And, and in that respect, Abbey is kind of, there is continuity. Abbey is or a return, if you will, to kind of pre-1974, pre-secular um, tendencies in Ethiopian political culture. Um, but yeah, I also argue that there is something more novel and distinctively 
Pentecostal, evangelical, or um, this is the term that comes up a lot, kind of prosperity gospel in, a- in Abby's way of, of, of thinking of his role and of politics. I argue that he is clearly informed um, by reli- an, a, a religious view of the world, and that, and that shapes the way he acts as a politician. Um, he believes he is sent by God to rule, but he also he has this prosperity gospel idea. Like you can call, I'm, I'm using that term in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a loose sense, a kind of soft prosperity gospel sense that you know material um, abundance or material success in life is a sign of God's favor, and that by spreading prosperity, you know that is that is taking you closer to heaven uh, and divine splendor. There's a ve- definite, unquestionably, his theory of change and development, how Ethiopia or any country can become rich, is one informed by uh, ideas quite kind of, yeah, I think to American listeners will sound like evangelical Republican even notions of kind of individual uplift and the idea that, you know, that you can, um, by pursuing material advancements you are also winning god's favor and that that kind of psychological um shift is what ethiopia needs collectively to become a prosperous nation right and that that shift in terms of attitude is a marked a departure from the traditionalism of ethiopian orthodox christianity and then also uh, the, the kind of Marxist ideology that had prevailed in in Ethiopia in the 70s into the 2010s. And this kind of prosperity gospel style, if it's not an ideology and for Abi, it may be at least a style, it's very American in some ways. And I think we'll unpack a bit later how he's very much an Americanophile in some, in some distinct ways. Now, uh, Abi comes to power in 2018. I, I'd like you to talk to us about the conditions that pave his rise to power then, and then what he does when he comes to power, because he's you know, awarded the Nobel Prize in 2019, and in this initial period in power, he does engage in some effort to make a genuine break with the past, but it may only be uh, skin deep, right? Yeah, so I have a chapter in the book called Abbey Mania, which sort of charts the, the um, excitement and whirlwind um, sensation of, of the early months of Abbey's. Um, premiership and yeah, he does a, he does a lot of things which took everyone by surprise, but and won him enormous domestic and international admiration. Releasing political prisoners, um, opening up the political space, inviting exiled dissidents to return, uh, all of this stuff, um, allowing for a certain um, flourishing of, of freedom of expression uh, and things like that, and also. You know, making peace with with Eritrea. Um, there had been a cold war between the two countries ever since the hot war in ninety eight to two thousand. Um, all of this kind of feeds into the Nobel Prize. Um, was Abby ever truly a democratizer or a, a you know a liberal democrat as some kind of projected onto him? No, I think. And to go back to the the question of his kind of contradictions, I think Abby wants to be seen, or at least when he came to power, wants to be seen on some level as, as, a, as a kind of le- popular, popularly elected, legitimate, democratic leader in the Western mold. Um, but he also, this coexists with this, I would say, more powerful um, desire to, to, to enjoy the trappings of monarchical rule as well, to style himself as a, a new Ethiopian emperor. Um, but ultimately, I think the democratization agenda, and that also included, by the way, a, a, a liberal economic or liberalization of the economy as well, um, that was primarily about consolidating his own position in 20, 2018, 2019. It was, you know, he, he comes to power with having, you know, having uh, quite, you know, a, a limited mandate and authority within the ruling coalition, the EPRDF, you know, he buys his elected for, um, the party elects him uh, to take over in 2018. Um, he has many enemies or at least opponents within the ruling coalition, obviously many Tigrayans, um, 
in the members of the TPLF in particular who aren't happy with 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 him and the way he he takes power. Um, so he needs to find alternative sources of of power and legitimacy. So he goes outside the EPRDF and and, and kind of reaches over their heads to the public by opening up the political space that wins him lots of kind of pop, personal popular support, but also internationally. He shrewdly, I think, recognizes that he needs international support uh, behind him to help secure his position and that, you know, democratizing or being seen to democratize is, is an important part of that. Uh, and, you know, as, as, as the Nobel Prize amply demonstrates, but much more than that, as I show in the book, the West, in particular, the West went along with this. Um, but actually, by 2020, it had become uh, very clear that Abbey's primary primary occupation was was maintaining his own position. He had uh, prioritized his position over the health of the democratic transition, and, and that was unfortunately um, a very dangerous move and one which remains uh, today a, a source of, of great instability. He declared himself, in effect, indispensable. Uh, and that has been, I think, one of the, the most um, damaging uh, consequences of his, of his term of power. So he was awarded the, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019, in part because of his, his domestic moves, including the release of uh, political prisoners, and then also because of effectively what was framed as a, a peace deal with Eritrea. But that reconciliation with Eritrea, in many respects, could be seen as actually paving the way for the emergence of the civil war in 2020, right? Because we have both uh, Abi and the Eritrean leadership effectively uniting to combat a common foe, which is uh, the, the, the party that had led the previous regime in Ethiopia, the, the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Uh, would you agree with that framing? Yeah. I mean, this is where, this is where things get really complicated in the sense that uh, you have an outside um, party, the Eritreans, um, uh, meddling or intervening in Ethiopian politics and the politics of the, the transition. Uh, I don't think people recognize this. Certainly the Nobel Prize committee didn't seem to recognize it. But yes, I'll, what we do know, I think, for sure, is that when Abiy reached out to the Eritreans, and to specifically the, the Eritrean dictator, Isaiah Zafwerki, in 2018 and said, I want to cut a deal, I want to make peace. Um, it wasn't just about brotherly relations between two you know, exceptionally interwoven societies, Ethiopia and Eritrea, nor was it just about you know, stabilizing the Horn of Africa, ending a long-running conflict, um, spreading kind of regional integration and trade, all the things which would definitely, you know, surely would be a, a, a positive um, consequence of any peace deal. What he was also undoubtedly looking for was an ally in his brewing confrontation with the TPLF, the, the formerly dominant component of the ruling coalition, the, the component which came to power in 1991, restructured the state, um, and, and then dominated it for several decades. He knew the TPLF very, very well, but he had a, he had a complicated relationship with them. And many, uh, he certainly resented them for, I think, not for, 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 not, for not giving him enough respect and, and, and power um, for many years inside the, inside the, the government. And and then ultimately, because he perceived them as trying to block his path to power. Uh, and then after he took power, sabotaging his administration. This is something else that he, he's constantly saying. They were, they were the state trying to thwart me at every turn. Now, conveniently for him, there is someone across the border in Eritrea who has similarly uh, hostile um, feelings towards the TPLF. Uh, Eritrea's dictator, Azai Safwaki, who has his own complicated, long history with the Tigrayans going right, way back to the 70s when there was an Eritrean liberation movement that was fighting alongside the Tigrayans against the Ethiopian state. All long, deep history. Uh, and then a war fought once Eritrea was independent from 98 and 2000. There's a lot of bad blood. 
Abby knows this. He goes to Asmara, the Eritrean capital, makes a deal with 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 Isaias. And we don't know exactly what the terms of that deal was or were. Many have speculated that right from the from the off there was a plan hatched to jointly crush the TPLF through force of arms. That has not been proven. There is, I'm afraid, no um, smoking gun. But we do know that over time, what seemed like a kind of diplomatic entente between two countries was in fact a political alliance between Abiy and Azaias against the Tigrayans, against specifically the TPLF, which gradually over 2018, 2019, 2018, 2020, grew more and more tense uh, and eventually led to war. Yeah, and uh, you know it's just striking how the international community misread Abi, and and to some extent, uh, you know your book suggests a lot of this was willful uh, in the sense that uh, there was a, a desire to kind of believe what Abi was saying because uh, to some extent it was convenient, and and seeing Abi through these pre-constructed frames of being a liberal reformer, of being Ethiopia's Obama. Uh, ra- uh, rather than situating him within the complicated long history of ethnicity and power in Ethiopia, I think outsiders kind of imposed their own framing, and and that served Abi's interests. So Abi is awarded for supposedly bringing to an end uh, this this uh, long conflict between Eritrea and Ethiopia. But uh, roughly a year after winning the Nobel, um, Ethiopia finds itself in yet another civil war. It's known as the Tigray War. And Isaiah, the the ruler of Eritrea, uh, has a longstanding grievance with the Tigrayans because of the brutal nature of the the war that uh, Eritrea and uh, Ethiopia had fought in the 1990s. And then Abi uh, has this uh, a similar desire for de-Tigrayization, it seemed, uh, because they are a pole of power uh, that he feels has framed as a kind of like a deep state to some extent, uh, sabotaging his efforts to, to, I don't know, make Ethiopia great again. So talk to us about how this war begins in 2020 and, and how it unfolds, because there are multiple stages. It begins, it starts, it stops, it begins again. And uh, what st- stands out is how brutal it is and, and, and also how much of that brutality uh, is unrecorded. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's considered to be or thought to have been possibly the deadliest war of the 21st century. Uh, the numbers dead are not really known, but certainly many hundreds of thousands, possibly a million or more, um, through bombs, bullets, but also starvation and hunger-related diseases. So it's a terrible conflict. And I, one of the point, you know, purposes of my book was to try and shed a bit, kind of convey that to people, to I think many in, in, in the West and America and where I'm from, the UK, do not kind of, it doesn't register particularly as one of the great wars of our time, which it absolutely was. Um, what... You know, how did it break out? Um, as you say, um, there are kind of different starting points or endpoints, but also, you know, wh- the moment where it actually begins um, is kind of contested in a way. I mean, Abby, the official line from Abby, Abby's government is it begins on November the 3rd, 2020, which, by the way, is the, the day of the American election, which some thought was not a co- coincidence, but I'll leave that for anyone who wants to read the book. But for Abby, it begins with the TPLF or militias and, and special forces allied to the TPLF attacking guard posts, uh, national guard posts in, in Tigray, uh, ransacking um, the armories, um, s- kind of stealing off with um, significant portion of the Ethiopian army's uh, heavy weaponry and slaughtering you know, fellow Ethiopian Ethiopian soldiers in their beds. That's not quite right. Um, the reality is the war had an effect already begun. In 2020, Ethiopia delayed uh, the elections it was meant to help hold that year, national elections, because of COVID. Uh, that could have been something that was manageable, even though that 2020 was you know, the, 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 the year when parliamentary term expired and there was a constitutional deadline for an election. 
But, you know, COVID, it's, you know, it's force majeure. There were, there were countries all around the world delaying their elections. Abby, however, used the, the, the pretext of COVID to unilaterally uh, reschedule the elections to a time more of his choosing uh, in order to maximize his, his chances of a, of a thumping victory. Um, this causes an, basically a constitutional crisis uh, and particularly exacerbates the tensions with the TPLF who were dead set on holding the elections on time and in fact catalyzes the, uh, the confrontation between, between the Ethiopian central government and, and Tigray, which by this point was very much uh, acting pretty independently and autonomy, autonomously of the rest of the country. Uh, they held their own elections, regional elections, in, 20, in September 2020. And this is seen and, and declared by Abiy's government as a gross violation of the constitutional order. It certainly was provocative. Uh, it certainly wasn't, I don't think, a helpful move on part of the TPLF. And it kind of hastened the showdown. After the TPLF won this regional election, both the federal government and the Tigray regional government declared the other to be illegitimate, basically um, illegitimate uh, leaders squatting, squatting in, uh, in the palace. Um, and this kind of mutual delegitimization, I think, and I argue, is where the war really becomes inevitable. Both sides were arming themselves, preparing for a confrontation. Abby was reaching out and coordinating with, uh, reaching out to and coordinating with the Eritreans across the border from Tigray, who were you know, geared up for particip participating in any uh, confrontation against the, the Tigrayans. Um, and Tigray was encircled on all sides. Um, it's, already, it's a very vulnerable, isolated, in, uh, landlocked region of um, and ex, you know, particularly vulnerable to encirclement on all sides. The, the region was encircled, and I visited it just before the war began. You had this real, real kind of visceral sense of, of the kind of fear and anxiety in that region and the absolute um, expectation that a war was coming. The region was also being asphyxiated slowly. I mean, they were, you know, um, the federal budget subsidy was being blocked. Um, fiscal transfers, um, support for farmers, all of this stuff from the federal government to the region, the federal kind of the, the basic architecture of the federal state was breaking down. And I think by October 2020, it was very clear that a war was, that a war was coming and had in fact all but begun. Um, and then on, on November the 3rd, 2020, this bit is very, un, it's not, it really isn't clear the extent to which uh, the Tigrayans uh, fired the first shot and raided the um, the command posts of the, the Ethiopian army, or had the Ethiopian army already launched its own uh, its own operations in Tigray in order to remove the TPLF from power. Not entirely clear, but point of the matter is by by November the fourth. I remember waking up early that morning um, to the announcement that. Abby had authorized a military operation and sent in the troops, um, sent in the fighter jets. Later, we learned, say, to, sent in the drones, uh, and, and war had begun. Yeah. And, you know, the Tigrayans may have fired the first shot, but as you make clear in your book, all sides were, were preparing for war. And yet, it seems like in the lead up to the war, the international community was largely ignoring the signals that were plain to see for you as someone who was there on the ground. So I'd like you to talk to us about why that was the case and, and what does that say about how, you know, the West, the UN and others approach a conflict in, in Ethiopia and, and maybe Africa at large? Yeah, and I actually, I'm pretty uh, critical specifically of, of America. Then it was, it was Trump's administration, which was you know, un unsurprisingly missing in action when it comes to Africa policy, but also the embassy in, in Ethiopia, the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia, which had very much embraced Abiy as their guy, you know, and the U.S. ambassador at the time described Abiy as basically a visionary and the most pro-West, pro-America leader we're ever going to get. Um, so they, they, they saw him as, as, as an ally. They'd invested a huge amount of political, but also actual financial capital in his administration and this idea of a democratic transition. I think as one a European ambassador said 
in late 2020, at this point, there's sort of egg on the face and we don't want to admit we might have screwed this up and, and, and backed, um, back someone who's really terrible for this country. Um, so there was also kind of, and, I, and there was also institutional kind of sloth, a uh, lack of coordination between different uh, Western capitals and how to, to, to respond in order to, to try and head off a conflict, a, a violent conflict. Um, and there was also, I think, institutional ignorance. You know, I was always struck by how little you know, embassies in Ethiopia, the guys who are meant to be kind of informing um, capitals and, and governments around the world about what's happening in Ethiopia, how little they really understood. They were often cloistered in, bu- in, their, in, in their embassies in the capital, uh, kind of talking to the same people, often with a kind of particular biases towards the government or towards a particular kind of strand of e- constituency in Ethiopia and didn't understand the complexity. Uh, and there was certainly no kind of, un- kind of real willingness to engage with the reality, which was the country was on an incredibly dangerous trajectory um, and that the prime minister himself was part of the problem because he saw himself as divinely ordained, but also uh, endorsed by the whole way to the, the international community and specifically you know, America and the West uh, in, in, in his kind of path to, um, to, 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 re, to remake Ethiopia in his own image. Um, and, and I think that meant that once the war began, Yes, there was very little, um, there had been little, very little kind of preparation uh, from, from the outside world and how to respond, but also a kind of an unwillingness, even once it had begun and once it was kind of abundantly clear how catastrophic it was and how, how far away it was from a, what the government at the time called a kind of, you might recognize this from, from, from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a kind of simple law and order operation. It was in fact a, arguably genocidal assault on a, on a minority grouping, um, a vulnerable minority grouping um, that was characterized from the outset by ethnic cleansing, mass rape, and, and, um, and starvation. Right. And, um, and, and, you know, so much of this brutality is actually, you know, not documented. And in part, that is due to the ability of the Ethiopian state to deny outsiders access, including aid, aid workers and, and the UN and others, access to large parts of the country. And so what's striking about this conflict is the wide range in terms of the estimates of the, of the fatalities. And so some say tens of thousands were killed in, in the Tigray War. Others say upwards of 600,000. And, and it's, you know, it's quite tragic because nowadays there's so much talk about Africa and how the United States and the West needs to pivot to Africa and compete with China and Russia. And so whenever there's something strategic going on in terms of infrastructure construction or a, a naval port call or something like that, there is a, a kind of a rush to, in the policy communities in the West to say, we need to be part of the mix. But in this dire moment uh, where we have hundreds of thousands of civilians massacred in the most brutal ways, uh, the West and other forces who uh, claim to be proponents of human rights were either engaged in willful ignorance or were, were very much on the back foot. And I think it shows that, you know, in terms of the so-called rules-based order and, and the type of norms we have in the international system, Africa is really um, sort of in a category of its own, and and just the amount of bloodletting that uh, is allowed to take place is just is is phenomenal. Now, Abi also, you know, he's able to sort of woo uh, the West and and uh, the United States, in particular the the Trump administration, because of you know this China card, and then also playing the evangelical card, the Christian card. Uh, which is, you know, pretty important in terms of the Trump administration. Uh, and he continues to be able to leverage uh, these, this emerging multipolar era to his benefit. So during the Tigray War, uh, he's armed um, not just by China, but also by Iran, Turkey, and the UAE, all of whom are, are rivals of one another. So I'd like you to talk to us about how he was able to get the support of all these different countries 
and and especially, uh, you know, what's the basis of that close relationship he has in particular with the Emiratis? Yeah, sure. I, I should just say, just to kind of clarify things for, for, for listeners, because it might be confusing. We've described him as an America file and he, he kind of a pro-Western leader, and, and that was the way he, he saw himself and, and articulated in his, his vision um, until the war began. But when the war begins, uh, at first under you know, the kind of dying days of the Trump administration, he gets a, he gets a, he gets a kind of free pass, no question about that. Um, but for the first, for, for 2021, probably you know, much 2022, there is actually quite um, energetic response from the incoming administration the new Biden administration, which puts it fairly high up on its list of uh, geopolitical headaches to, to respond to. I do, and I kind of explained some of the, those efforts that were made um, by, by the Biden administration uh, at first, and they, they put quite a lot of pressure, economic, financial pressure, on, on the Ethiopian government to try and force it to the negotiating table with the TPLF. And that's actually what prompts Abiy to, to pivot um, and his relationship with America completely plummets, um, plummets to depths not seen since the kind of Soviet um, days of the uh, of the Derg in the 1970s, the Marxist military regime. Um, and for a while, you know, it, it looks like the relationship, you know, is not going to cannot be mended. I mean, bear in mind, Ethiopia and America have a very strong, very very strong ties going back decades. Huge Ethiopian American population, uh, as you know, in, in in American places like DC, um, and yeah, h- historic ties going back to the uh, Haile Selassie era. Um, it seems in 2021 that that might all be falling apart completely, um, as Abby responds to uh, pressure from the Biden administration to negotiate and also to open up humanitarian uh, access for humanitarian aid, which she wasn't doing because starvation was. You know, was a weapon of war uh, from the beginning, um, you know, from the beginning of the Tigray War. So Abbey kind of feels really, I, th- I think the word is betrayed by what he's, you know, by 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 America. He, he believes himself to be kind of America's, you know, close friend. And and middle of 2021, he's made it very clear and says it in his public addresses that he thinks the West and America specifically is trying to overthrow him. There are, you know, uh, 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 comparisons are made to. You know, Libya or, or Iraq, you know, Western back regime changed efforts. None of that actually is, is the case, but that's the way, you know, he saw it and he sought to kind of reposition himself as a kind of pan Africanist, anti colonial, kind of anti Western leader. I mean, you know, this has been disingenuous and this is the kind of, this is the populist side to Abbey. Uh, you know, really was extraordinarily popular speech, kind of populist speeches we were hearing in, in 2021. Uh, and he sort of makes it very clear that he is going to drift into the to the kind of Russia um, orbit, China, which he had kind of weaker ties with because he, you know, he, he saw uh, the Chinese Communist Party as godless and Marxist. So he wasn't instinctively very drawn to them, much un, you know, unlike the TPLF, which had good cl- good close ties to China for, for many decades. But he, he draws closer to to the Russians, the Chinese, to to the Iranians. He goes goes seeking uh, drones, and he does it with the financial support of the Emiratis. Uh, as you mentioned, they are a key, um, key ally of Abiy throughout this, throughout this period. In fact, they played a part in the Ethio-Eritrea peace deal of 2018, the one which won the Nobel Prize. They are there. Uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of, then Crown Prince of, of the UAE, is there in the background. He has a very strong and, I have to say, quite perplexingly close personal bond with Abby, and basically swings behind him from very early on with cash, with investments in real estate, agriculture, and, and a whole swathe of industries, and providing military um, training for the new Republican Guard, which Abby establishes, all of this stuff. And then also ultimately um, purchasing and 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 fixing up uh, Chinese drones, which were then transported to to Ethiopia and 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 formed part of the arsenal, which he brought to bear uh, during the Tigray War, and which ultimately played a crucial role in in defeating the TPLF. 
Right. And, and and talk to us about that relationship with uh, MBZ, the president of the UAE, and uh, he's also the ruler of Abu Dhabi, because the two men share some uh, some commonality in terms of personality, or maybe Abi um, uh, seeks to aspire to be like MBZ. There is this kind of obsession with the modernization or in in kind of very uh, a very cosmetic form. What what links the two men? Yeah, there was I had an interesting. Uh, there's a quote from a, from a from a senior American diplomat making that exact kind of point. You know what 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 draws them to one another? In some ways, they're very different. MBZ is one of the most sort of secular guys on earth. Very disciplined. Doesn't um, you know? Um, very self contained. Abby is messianic, erratic, um, contradictory. Um, um, the opposite in some respects. But they do share, as you said, they, they, they do share some similarities. They both see themselves as kind of pioneering modernizers um, who are kind of reshaping not just their own countries, but the wider region in their own image. Um, they also have an interest in kind of um, high-tech um, surveillance technologies, um, this, things like that. Um, whatever it is, they, they clearly have a bond. Um, because I don't think there's anyone closer to Abby on, on the international stage um, to this day, and, and, and a loyal friendship as well. But it's also, I think it has something to do with the, the image that, the, that Dubai and Abu Dhabi has in, among certain Ethiopians, and not just Ethiopians, many Africans today, they look to the kind of gleaming ordered metropolises of the Gulf, in particular Dubai, uh, and see that as a kind of image um, of the kind of countries they would like to create. I suppose it's a bit like, you know, Singapore was often touted, you know, in the 90s as you know, countries like Eritrea, um, Rwanda, you know, described them or aspired to be the kind of Singapores of Africa. It's all about now for many, for many leaders in the continent, I think, particularly Abbey, kind of modeling or emulating Dubai. And Abbey has done that very dramatically in Addis Ababa. Which is another kind of important part of the book is the way he's reshaped, you know, Addis Ababa, but in his own image and in the image of Dubai, and torn down huge swathes of of the historic core of 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 the capital to make way for a kind of you know gleaming high rises, some of them funded by by the the, the Emiratis themselves, uh, built a new palace. Funded by the Emiratis, um, gigantic palace. Um, all of this funded by the Emiratis, the Gulf. We have to say we don't know for sure because there's absolutely no transparency. Which I should add is, I think, something he also uh, admires um, and appreciates in, in the way that the Gulf monarchs do business. You know, it's, it's transactional, it's 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 personal, and it's it's certainly not transparent. Right, and that transactionality may be what's uh, what what is ultimately uh, brings the two men together. And you know, we often talk about the China model these days, but for many non-Western countries, particularly in Asia and Africa, uh, it's the UAE that is a model uh, serves as a model for uh, for development, at least in a very cosmetic form. And it's comparable to how, let's say, you know, early. Uh, rulers of uh, non-Western countries sought to emulate, let's say, France, England, or or Germany in the in the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. Now, final question: uh, Ethiopia has a a rapidly growing population. It's currently around one hundred twenty million. Could rise to over three hundred million by the end of the century. And and like his people, Abiy Ahmed is young. He's he's forty seven. Uh, this this country, uh, to some extent, has a lot of potential. And uh, yet, Ethiopia has been unable under Abi to escape, uh, you know, what you describe in the book as cycles of hypercentralization, and then this chaotic disintegration. And so, once the Tigray War comes to an end, the conflict with the Amharas uh, is is reignited. And now, there's also there's also been this year talk of war with Eritrea. So it seems like Abi has actually triggered a, a tripwire. So, in your view, what would it take for Ethiopia to escape this 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 cycle that has long doomed it, and is it even possible? Yeah, I'm 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 always careful with offering prescriptions or 
or solutions because it, you know, these are questions ultimately, particularly when it comes to, you know, the cycles of disintegration and centralization. These are questions which Ethiopians have been, have been grappling with for uh, centuries, more recently in, in decades, in various ways, and come up with various answers. And there isn't clearly a, a simple one. Uh, the kind of central question raised by Ethiopian revolutionary students, uh, you know, five decades ago, you know, what is Ethiopia and can it hold? I mean, it remains as live as ever, if not more so under Abbey than it's, than it's ever been. I don't think any region in Ethiopia is, is about to declare independence, even though, you know, for a while it seemed that Tigray might be about to, uh, you know, whatever the constitution says, clearly Abbey, you know, sees himself as, uh, as on a, divine mission to keep Ethiopia together and to make it great. So he will not allow the disintegration of the country on his watch. But the reality is the bonds which bind the constituents part seem to be, seem to be fraying, seem to be weakening. Uh, they t appear, I would say, weaker than they've ever been. Political elites in Ethiopia are consumed by mutual suspicion. I don't know what the way out is. I would, I would say that there are a few, there are a few lessons in the last few years. One is that precipitous unilateral attempts to centralize and personalize power to radically overhaul this con controversial but you know, deeply embedded constitutional arrangements will likely backfire. That's one of the, that was one of the lessons of the Tigray war itself, and they will, fight, they will backfire violently. The other lesson, I think, is that no one leader is indispensable or holds all the answers. Abbey has positioned himself or claimed himself to be in possession of those answers and to be indispensable. He has set Ethiopia on a, on a very dangerous path as a result. But I also, and this is my final point, is yes, my book is about, to a large degree, about the role of an individual leader. But of course, Ethiopia's problems go well beyond just one man. There is blame more than enough blame to go around. And it's, a, of course, an extraordinarily complex country, you know, freighted by or burdened by uh, the weight of, 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 a, of a complicated history, which it's impossible for anyone to completely shake off. But it does mean that the country needs to have some sort of, you know, this is, this is now a bit of a cliche among, you know, people or analysts talking about Ethiopia, but some sort of political genuine political dialogue between the various constituencies, the various identity groups, political uh, factions to chart a common path forward. And, it's, and that's the sort of thing that sounds you know, probably easier uh, said than done. And it would be unquestionably extraordinarily difficult to achieve anything like a kind of consensus. You know, America, Ethiopia is very much like America in some respects in terms of the kind of foundational tenets of its nationhood being in dispute, you know, culture, and, and from that kind of uh, culture wars sort of tearing it apart, Ethiopia is similar to America in that regard. So it's never going to be easy. But I think the last few years have taught us that the attempts to impose uh, a solution from our eye to declare that you know the answer and that, you know, frankly, that you know, God, God told you it, it, it is simply not the way forward.